Hello and welcome. This is class number 22 of the quick revision series for UPSC prelims 2024. I really hope your preparation is going on track and these classes have been helping you revise. Once again, reminding you, do hit the subscribe button on this channel if you have not done so till now. And also you can get PDF of all these lectures. All that you need to do is become part of our Telegram channel. The link of which is in the description of the video. I upload all the PDFs of these lectures right there. Let's see. What are the important news stories of the last one year that we'll be discussing today? Starting with number 221. Something that was in the news is earthquake swarm. Now, what exactly is earthquake swarm? As the name suggests, earthquake swarm means a phenomena when a lot of very small earthquakes happen in a very short period of time. You would have seen this term that is used in in relation to drones as well. Swan of drones is being used to now have a very impressive exhibition, which kind of looks like a exhibition of art in the sky, kind of looks like there are festivals going on. It looks like there is explosion going on, but all these are done with the help of drones. That is also called the swarm of drones. Similarly, earthquake swarm is something that was seen in Iceland, which led to a warning of a volcano in the region. As I said, it is nothing but a series of small earthquakes that occur in a localized area in a short duration of time. This short duration basically doesn't have to be just minutes. This short duration can also be days, weeks and even months. They usually conclude within a few days or months. So when you have several low intensity earthquakes happening very close to each other, that is called as earthquake swamp. They usually are seen over time, but this is very difficult to predict just like other earthquakes. Earthquakes, as you know, is one of those natural phenomena that still cannot be predicted. Anyone who claims they can predict it is lying to you. That is why it becomes very, very difficult. However, there are buildings that are now being made in such a manner that they are able to withstand earthquakes to a very, very large extent. You have seen a lot of countries Earthquakes are not able to damage certain buildings because they were made in such a manner that the seismic activity does not have an impact on them. Also, these earthquake swarms can produce thousands of earthquakes within a relatively small volume of area. They usually occur in regions with complex contiguous fracture systems. So it's all a function of where that location is, what are the tectonic plates under it, that is the area which are more prone to earthquakes as compared to others. Next news about cloud seeding. Cloud seeding is something that you keep on hearing, that you keep on listening about time and time again. This was in the news in the last few months, especially with respect to Dubai. Now, Dubai tried cloud seeding and they were successful in bringing rain. But a few months later, Dubai saw the worst floods in its history. So a lot of people started to draw connections. Connection as in, was cloud seeding responsible for the flood that Dubai saw? So far, there has not been any connection that has been found. There is no proof to say that cloud seeding activity actually led to flooding many weeks later on. However, this topic of cloud seeding has been in the news. It's not just Dubai, many other countries have also tried this. Experiments on cloud seeding have also been done in India. What exactly is cloud seeding? Basically, just understand how are the rains formed. When the clouds become heavy enough with water and ice particles mainly, when they are not able to sustain, when the clouds become saturated, that is when the ice particles now start to drop down. When they reach the surface, they are usually in the form of rain. Now, when the clouds don't have enough moisture content, when the clouds don't have enough content to convert it into rain artificially you can introduce a foreign object into the cloud to now ensure that cloud becomes heavy enough and it results into rain this is called cloud seeding it's done for a lot of purposes single biggest purpose why it is done is to increase the amount of rainfall produced on the other hand it is also done to reduce hail from thunderstorm and in some cases, it is also done to improve visibility due to fog. As you know, whenever there is rainfall, fog gets dispersed. So rainfall is an enemy of the fog. So when there's a lot of fog and you have an important event, for example, you have, let's say, important dignitaries coming into your country. 
and in that particular city where they are coming there's a lot of fog so what do you do you try and have artificial rainfall to make sure that the fog disperses that is also one of the applications of cloud seeding it's not a very new technology in fact the first evidence of cloud seeding and this study was done in 1940s at the general electric this g company's lab in new york it has not been used in very large numbers or in many instances around the world it is used in very rare occurrences the reason is see it does not develop its own cloud so in order for cloud seeding to be successful you need to have cloud beforehand also you need to have at least some moisture content in the cloud you can't just expect from 0 to take it to 100 it does enhance the rainfall by about 10 to 15% but you cannot be sure that wherever there are cl uh, clean skies you can't just produce cloud out of this this is how it is used the foreign material that is used to ingest in the cloud that is ingested in the cloud is usually silver iodide there are other substances that can also be used but usually these are silver iodide uh, kais crystals that are usually sent to the cloud there are two ways in which you can do that either from the ground itself try and basically target it so that the crystals are released and they reach the cloud or the better way or the easier way is to basically use aeroplanes drop it from the aeroplanes on the cloud so that they can have these crystals as i said it does not result into new clouds creation do you remember that it just increases the amount of rainfall by 10 to 15% as compared to the existing clouds by adding these tiny particles inside the cloud the water vapor freezes into these particles the heavier the frozen particle the more are the chances that it will fall towards the ground in the form of rain as i said in india also these experiments have been done by iit kanpur specifically in maharashtra some of the materials that are usually used in cloud seeding are silver iodide usually then there is dry ice potassium iodide propane calcium carbide all these are the materials that are usually used in cloud seeding next important news rare uralite meteorite was formed from the dhola structure in madhya pradesh what exactly is this so there are a lot of meteorites that have managed to come to earth in thousands and millions of years a lot of them are still present on the earth many of these have been studied by the scientists a special form of meteorite is named as the uralite meteorite uralite name comes from the place in russia where the first evidence of such meteorite was actually seen these meteorites are rare they have a different kind of a composition they are considered to be very 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 old so old that the material with which they are composed or material by which they are made seems to be the material that was used in the very beginning of the solar system and this is why it is a very interesting discovery that the dhala crater the, the dhala crater is in madhya pradesh in india it's a huge crater it was a result of collision from a very rare ancient meteorite called the uralite as i said it's a very rare kind of a uralite a very rare kind of a meteorite very 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 old it is named after locality where the first specimen was found in russia very primitive very primitive in nature means it it is composed of very very old material material from which it is believed that the solar system was initially formed so any study into this meteorite can help us understand a lot of things about a solar system and its composition this is different from other meteorites in the sense that it is usually made up of silicate rock olivine and pyroxene and has about 10% carbon they contain elongated cavities as well that is how they are usually different as compared to the other meteorites that are found what about the dhala crater which is the focus of this entire study it is one of the oldest and the largest impact craters in india so crater basically is when something falls down something huge falls down on the ground it creates a kind of an empty space it creates a kind of a hole right so that hole is called the crater they estimated that it is about 2500 million years old and is named after the village dhala it's located in the shekpuri district in madhya pradesh it's about 11 km in diameter 
making it the largest crater in entire Asian continent. Next news about Earth Overshoot Day. Every single year, the Earth Overshoot Day is concluded earlier as compared to the last year. What exactly is the Earth Overshoot Day? So for example, let's say we say that 15th of October was the Earth Overshoot Day. What it means is between the 1st of Jan and the 15th of October, we already used all the ecological resources and services that the earth would take one year to generate. So the day throughout the year, the day on which we have already consumed the ecological resources that the earth is able to reproduce in one year, that is called the earth overshoot day. So ideally for a sustained living, we should be able to consume or we should only consume as much resources as can be reproduced by earth in one year. Right? That is the direct that is the entire definition of sustainability. When you consume more than you can produce, that is when the problem starts. This is the issue with Earth Overshoot Day. It was first calculated in 1987. Back then, in 1987, it was on 19th of December. So you were much better on 19th of December. We had taken into consideration or we had actually consumed all the resources that the earth could produce in one year. Now by 2023, we have reached this on 2nd of August. So just about seven months, two days is what we have taken for the amount of resources that the earth will regenerate in one single year. This is used to calculate or global footprint network usually calculates the earth overshoot day by taking into consideration the consumption habits of people around the world. This is usually how it is calculated. To remember, now we have reached 2nd of August. By the way that the humanity is progressing, the Earth Overshoot Day will come closer and closer and closer, which is not a very good sign. Next, we have the Fujifara effect. What is the Fujifara effect? Basically, in simple terms, when we have two cyclones or we have two, let's say, uh, tornadoes or hurricanes, whatever you want to call it. When we have two hurricanes or two cyclones at a certain distance, if they are moving in the same direction, they get attracted to each other. When they get attracted, they usually interact with each other and they can either mix together to form one big hurricane or they can start basically revolving around each other around a common center. This is called the Fujiara effect. Meaning that when there are two hurricanes or two cyclones, how they interact with each other, how they behave, this is called the Fujiara effect. As I said, it occurs when two nearby cyclonic storms or hurricanes or typhoons, whatever you want to call it, they are close enough to interact with each other their interaction is given this name. When they are spinning in the same direction, they are brought close to each other. There are multiple outcomes, multiple possibilities here. If there are small cyclones, small hurricanes, they might combine to form a bigger one. They might also interact with each other and lead to a change in direction. That can be extremely dangerous. The reason is whenever any country faces hurricanes or uh, typhoons or tornadoes etc you first try and map what their movement will look like so there is a lot of prediction that goes into where the cyclone will head next so that the government can carry out evacuation activities in such cases when two cyclones interact or when they change their path it becomes very unpredictable about how and where the cyclone will go next and that becomes slightly problematic they usually can form a bigger uh, cloud or a bigger cyclone or they can also remain separate and kind of down around each other around the same common center that is also called the Fujiara effect. Next news 226 in a good news for India and Indian government's efforts five more wetlands from India have been added to the Ramsar list as you know the Ramsar convention is the only international convention around the world focusing especially on the conservation of the wetlands. Now wetlands anyways has always been an important topic. UPSC does ask questions on wetlands. 
both in prelims and the mains exam the government of india itself has been focusing a lot on wetlands by launching a lot of programs making sure that local community also becomes a part of such efforts and in as a part of those efforts five more wetlands in india are now added to the ramsar list what do you have to remember first most importantly remember the location that is the state and a few other facts about this for example if there's something unique about them so what are these five first aghana shi eshuri that is in karnataka it is located at a place where aghana shi river meets the arabian sea this is a place where you see a lot of biodiversity you see a lot of fishing agricultural activities taking place in this area in karnataka again there is a magadi kere conservation reserve which has also been added to the list it is human made reservoir for rain water storage it has become home to over 160 bird species including 130 bird species importantly it is an important winter ground for bar headed goose then in karnataka again there is something called the anka samudra bird conservation reserve it is again human made village irrigation tank it is the only bird reservation reserve in north karnataka dry zone here again you see about 200 species of different birds from tamil nadu we have the karaiveti bird sanctuary one of the largest inland wetlands in tamil nadu it's a part of the famous central asian flyway which the migratory birds take when they uh, flow in from siberia to this part of the world and they carry on for ensuring that they are able to sustain themselves during harsh weather number 5th again from tamil nadu the longwood shola reserve forest it's named after solai which is the name of a tropical rain forest it's famous for endangered species such as the black chin nilgiri laughing thrush nilgiri blue robin etc about the ramsar sites there are a few facts that you should remember for example india's largest ramsar site is the sundarbans in west bengal india's smallest ramsar site is the renuka wetland in himachal pradesh while the first ramsar sites from india or first indian wetlands to be included in the ramsar list were the chilka lake and the kaladeo national park do remember this because again wetlands has always been one of those topics that are repeatedly asked by upsc in various forms what about the ramsar convention remember india was not a founding member of the ramsar convention the ramsar convention was established in 1971 as the only international conservation uh, effort for wetlands india signed this in 1982 where are most of the ramsar sites located in india tamil nadu followed by uttar pradesh among the nations it is uk that has the most ramsar sites followed by mexico do remember this fact numbers are not important but do remember where is it that the largest number of these sites are found both in india and around the world as well there is one more uh, information regarding this that is a montrix record what is this it is a list of those wetlands in the ramsar site or the ramsar list that are of international importance so basically let's understand it in this manner there are a lot of wetlands not all the wetlands are in the ramsar list so basically there are a lot of wetlands some of them are in the ramsar list some of those within the ramsar list are in the montrex record so the montrex record are those wetlands where a lot of ecological changes are occurring due to human interference pollution etc so they need to be reserved from india's only two wetlands are a part of this record the loktak lake in manipur and the kaladeo national park so not all the wetlands around the world are a part of the ramsar list from the ramsar list some of them where there is a lot of human interference going on where there have to be very strict conservation activities monitored they are a part of the montrex record interestingly chilka lake was also part of this record but it was removed in 2002 when it was found out that there have been a significant improvement in the health of this particular wetland next 2 to 7 this is about an area called the terai arc landscape now terai arc or terai region is a very very interesting area it is on the foothill of the himalayas 
it it spread across states such as up uttarakhand it goes to nepal now this is an area where there is significant tiger population and there have been efforts made to conserve tiger population in this area both in india and nepal what the un has done the united nations has recognized this or has given global recognition to this particular initiative they have given global recognition to nepal's terai arc landscape initiative which was launched in 2001 and they have designated this as one of the seven world restoration flagships so again there are different flagship programs that un has recognized total seven are recognized as world restoration flagship programs out of these seven one of them is the terai arc landscape program the terai area is one of the most fertile areas in the country where you see a lot of cultivation happening it stretches about 810 km from river yamuna in the west to river bhagimati in the east it spans across states of uttarakhand up bihar and then goes up to nepal it comprises of about 13 protected areas in this region where we have the corbett tiger reserve the rajaji national park valmiki tiger reserve and there are there are some in nepal as well the objective of this particular landscape project by nepal is to conserve the species found in this area including tiger rhinoceros elephant also to conserve critical habitat and make sure that there is cooperation between the two sides india and nepal going ahead because when you have these kind of habitats be it national parks wildlife sanctuaries rivers etc that are shared between two countries their conservation efforts have to be in hand in hand only then they will be successful and that is why india and nepal are working together here what about the un world restoration flagships as i told you un has recognized seven initiatives from different parts of the world and given them the tag of world restoration flagships this was launched in 2021 by the un the idea of the un is to pre prevent stop and reverse the degradation of ecosystems in every continent so they look for these areas in every continent they try and support these areas which are looking to restore their original ecosystem and this particular terai arc landscape has been chosen in that regard by the un next news number 228 largest deep sea coral mapping has been done now what is interesting is if you think about the corals coral reefs are usually seen in shallow waters not in very deep waters there are reasons for that for the biggest reasons is that corals in order to produce their food require sunlight and when you go deeper into the ocean deeper into the sea you don't get sunlight so you can't have photosynthesis so corals that is why essentially were mainly found in shallow waters however now world's largest deep sea corals have been found in us along the east coast of the us we have found out the scientists other have found out huge reserves of coral now this coral reef is around 500 km long from florida to south carolina now it's interesting and important for you to understand how is it that deep sea corals are different as compared to normal shallow corals and i said this is huge in length about 500 km and width of about 110 km it's not a new discovery scientists knew about this since 1960s but they were never able to map it completely because of lack of technology they could never actually get the complete accurate results and measurement how long and how wide is it and now they have been able to do that they have been able to construct 3d images of the ocean floor to get more information about it now how are deep sea corals different so they lack sunlight obviously because of it they can't have photosynthesis so in order for their survival they need to have some different strategies for example they produce bioluminescent bioluminescent light meaning that they batch they actually have a light around them they try and illuminate so that they can attract species fish etc which are interested in knowing what is happening in this area so they use their unique ability 
to have some light or to glow in the dark so that other species can come in out of curiosity and that is how they feed on them they grow slowly as compared to shallow corals because again they have little food as compared to the shallow uh, corals because they can have sunlight they have colder temperatures and that is why their growth is limited they are deep in the sea so the pressure that they face of water is obviously much much higher they have reinforced skeletons which are made up of calcium carbonate or protein there is also a table that i have given here for you to understand and remember the difference between deep and shallow water corals the shallow water corals are usually brown and green in color the deep sea corals are usually white in color the deep sea ones go much beyond 200 meters to several thousand meters in depth light availability for shallow corals is much much better so they can undergo photosynthesis so they have much faster growth of their structure the deep sea one don't have that these are some of the differences between these two then news number 229 in odisha the famous gupteshwar forest has been declared as a biodiversity heritage site this declaration comes in from the state so the central government does not do that it is on the state government to make such declarations so it is the odisha biodiversity board that has been asked by the odisha government to prepare a plan for the conservation of this particular forest it is adjacent to the famous gupteshwar shiva temple in the koraput district of odisha it is the fourth biodiversity heritage site in the state of odisha this forest is pretty big it's about 350 acres of area and it has sacred groves we have discussed about sacred groves earlier sacred groves are those forest that are considered religious sacred by the tribal community living in that area odisha as you know has a significant amount of tribal community in and around that area the forest is home to over 600 fauna species and about 28 species of mammals as well there have been lot of different interesting species that have been found i don't have to remember that you don't have to remember which animals are found here you don't have to remember which plants are found here just remember that it's not the first bio heritage site of odisha it is the fourth one remember it is in odisha remember it is uh, adjacent to the famous shiva temple of the 4th century just remember these facts and you will be good to go now what about the bio diversity heritage sites as i said these are areas that are designated as such by the state government they are recognized under the biological diversity act 2002 the state government issues an official order after consulting the local bodies there are no restrictions imposed as such it's not that now that odisha government has said it's a biodiversity site so people can't come or people would have restriction no there's no restriction as such does that the government will now put more efforts towards its conservation so the local community does not have to feel threatened that their rights are being taken away or they won't be allowed here everyone who was allowed earlier will be allowed now also does that more conservation preservation efforts will now go on here <clears throat> if you look at the history of biodiversity sites in india among the biodiversity heritage sites the first one was in bangalore that is the nalur tamarind grove that was the first biodiversity heritage site declared in 2007 by the karnataka government right now india has 45 biodiversity heritage sites <clears throat> the last five that were added are here haldirchar island in west bengal birampur baguran jalpai in west bengal again then there sikkim odisha that have named other sites as the biodiversity heritage sites again state government does that without any interference from the central government if you want to revise this is a pictorial representation of the different biodiversity heritage sites that we have so you can go through that don't have to remember all of them but just for your knowledge you can go through that as well the last news for this particular class is the vadge bank ecosystem and hydrocarbon exploration what exactly is this i'll first show you the map so if you come south from kanyakumari this area this is called the vadge bank so basically what has happened this is an important area this is india this is sri lanka so it's a part of india's exclusive economic zone eez 
Now, what happens is the government of India has found out that there is a lot of hydrocarbon potential in and around this area. So the government of India has been contemplating plans to explore oil towards this area, around this area. The experts, however, the environmental experts suggest that the government should not do that. This anyways is a very fertile fishing ground. A lot of fishing activity happens nearby this area. Biodiversity, etc. is pretty high in this area. So any external influence or any external interference here would be bad for the environment. This is where the government has to take a decision whether or not we should go for hydrocarbon exploration in this area or not. This is one of India's richest fishery resource areas. This particular uh, Vardge bank is actually a submerged plateau. So it's a kind of a plateau, not exactly at the ocean bed. It is about 10,000 square kilometer area towards the south of Kanyakumari. It is characterized by low tidal amplitude. It has weak current, so it is relatively easier to explore oil in this area. It has a diverse marine life, including fish and other invertebrates. And that is why the government of India is now contemplating whether or not we should undertake these exploration activities in this area. This brings you to the end of this class. I really, really hope you are learning new things and revising. It's helping you out. Do join the Telegram channel. If you want the PDF of these, do tell your friends also about this. They can come here and revise quickly whatever have been the current affairs of the last one year. In case you missed out on any of the earlier classes, I'm giving the link of the playlist in the description of the video. Go through that and make sure that you have gone through each and every class. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Jai.